Sponsored by World of Warships. Have you ever met the Poles? They're a fantastic bunch. Great at curing meat. Like seriously, their deli meats are absolutely incredible. And they can also drink. My god! Can they drink? And I'm an Australian who regularly hangs out with a notorious alcoholic pig, so it means a lot when I say that. I personally actually prefer Polish vodka above all else, because it punches you in the face, but in a friendly and fun way. I mean, really, their parties and their metal gigs are absolutely legendary, and they've got that legend for a reason. Just look at the hype, and you should see their football matches. I've travelled London to go across Europe. I've seen the most incredible pyro displays that a football fan can witness. But I have never, ever seen this. But you know what's even more insane than Poland's football matches? World of Warships. That's right, the legends over at Wargaming have kindly sponsored this video to promote their absolutely incredible free-to-play naval combat game. Which is good for me, because I actually really wanted the latest Azure Lane DLC. But anyway, on to the game. The graphics are incredible. I can pick out all the individual details on the ships as they sail through gorgeous environments with incredible water effects and atmospheric weather. And these ship details are like so intricately modelled. They even come with all the different upgrades and refits that they had throughout their entire service lives. It's crazy, it's like a digital museum. And this is spread across the entire range of ship classes. You can play as destroyers, battleships, carriers, cruisers, and even submarines, which you can then use to do battle in massive 12v12 PvP matches in enormous arenas that are truly a sight to behold. And it never gets boring. Why? Because new content comes out every month with different cosmetics, skins, flags, and even ships. They do collabs with just about everybody. But the best part is you can do it with anyone anywhere. That's right, you can bring your friends if you want to in your own division and you can do it on either PC or console. That's right, it's console compatible. So what are you waiting for? Join one of the most dedicated wargaming communities out there and click the link in the description and use the promo code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Promo code WARSHIPS. Link in the description. Thank you to our sponsor, World of Warships, and now, onto the video. I love Poland, and I love the Poles. To non-Polish people, they seem wild and free-spirited, aggressive and opinionated, and sometimes a little too much. But if you've had a history like theirs, you might understand why. For the Poles have had one of the darkest stories in all of humanity's myriad of cultures. In the modern era, they have had a homeland to call their own for only a combined half a century or so. The rest of it spent under the boots of one tyrant or as the puppet of another. They value their freedom in a way that only other cultures who felt that boot on their neck really understand, and it's why in every war they've ever fought throughout their entire history, they've distinguished themselves as the most dedicated warriors on the battlefield. The traditions of the Polish military and their tales of valour are some of the most cherished and storied parts of Poland's history, for very good reason. The winged hussars riding to the rescue of Vienna, the Polish legion under Napoleon, the Polish destroyer Piron charging down the Bismarck, the heroes of 303 squadron shooting down German bombers at twice the rate of British pilots. There are so many stories and legends I could tell. But today, I want to tell a story that not many people know, unless they go out of their way to learn it. It's a story of ingenuity and courage in the face of overwhelming odds. A story of men who never gave up and carried the day, despite being in an almost impossible situation. This is the story of the Polski Startek Orzel, or, in English, the Polish Ship Eagle. This is the story of the Tallinn Incident. Our story begins in 1931, and when I say begins, I mean quite literally begins. There is a reason all of Poland's daring naval escapades take place during World War II. Turns out being practically landlocked for centuries is not conducive to dominating the high seas. As part of the Treaty of Versailles ending World War I, Poland was established as its own sovereign nation, which included a strip of land leading to the port city of Gdynia and the free city state of Danzig, overseen by the League of Nations. 
This strip of land earned the nickname the Polish Corridor, and its existence, separating East Prussia from Germany, would be the casus belli for Nazi Germany to invade in 1939. But the Polish Republic had already been invaded before by, surprise surprise, who could have guessed, the Soviet Union in 1919. It was a brutal war, and it pushed the newly created nation right to the brink. However, a heroic victory in defense of the capital Warsaw turned the tide, leading to a devastating counterattack that vanquished the invaders and forced them to the negotiation table. The miracle on the Vistula, as it came to be called, guaranteed and secured their independence. But with a chaotic militaristic Germany on one border and a humiliated, very angry, rapidly industrializing Soviet Union on the other, keeping that freedom was going to require some insurance. Despite the major disparity between Poland and its impending aggressors, there is a bit of a misconception about their unpreparedness for the invasion. Contrary to popular belief, Poland was very, very well armed and had taken steps to improve their national defence considerably. The major problems of course were, as it always is in matters of defence appropriations, time and money. They couldn't afford the mass expansions of military capability underway in the rest of Europe, nor could they continuously modernise, but it was not for a lack of effort. There was considerable investment in purchasing more modern equipment from countries in the West, as well as obtaining production licences. And among those purchases was a new flotilla of submarines, bought from the Dutch. And one of those submarines would be paid for entirely from public donations to the National Maritime Defence Fund. That ship's name was the Orza, or the Eagle, and she was an absolute monster for the time. Coming in at 84 metres long and over a thousand tonnes displacement, she was a modern submarine capable of 19 knots on the surface and 9 knots submerged, completely decked out in the most literal sense. A 4 inch deck gun for anti-shipping, a 40 millimetres Bofors gun for anti-air defence, and 12, count them, 12 torpedo tubes. 12! With a reload for every single one. It was a seriously deadly and expensive machine, but there was method in the madness. The Polish Navy's logic was, rather ironically, similar to the Soviet Navy's. Competing with the major European powers, ship for ship, the naval powers that is, wasn't going to work. They just didn't have the maritime infrastructure or the coastline or the overseas interest to justify it, or the tonnage to compete. Submarines are affordable and effective relative to surface combatants, not to mention survivable. They can sink several ships, each three times their cost on average, while being very good at both reconnaissance and blockade running, as well as deploying special forces and spies behind enemy lines, that sort of thing. They're very useful, making them the perfect choice when fighting against an enemy with naval supremacy. However, despite this strategy being patently obvious, well-reasoned, and fiscally sensible, not everyone in the same position shared this idea. Oh, oh. It's evil. It's diabolical. It's lemon scented. This plan Z can't possibly fail. <sighs> Even after all the decades of research and all the books written by my seniors, how the so called Ubermensch conquered most of Europe is still a mystery. And speaking of. The side-fringed fascist, grappling with his clinical depression and impending financial depression of his own making, his failed art career, and his ever-disappearing chance of becoming a homeowner, decided that uh, real estate acquisition by alternative methods was the order of the day. And if any of my fellow millennials are watching, remember how this story ends before you get any ideas. The Munich Agreement had sought to ensure peace in our time, as Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain put it. However, the total annexation of Czechoslovakia a month later had placed Poland in a precarious position. They were now flanked on three sides by German territory, while the Soviets were ominously sharpening a dagger to their rear. It didn't take a genius to work out what the monobolocked moron was planning. After all, he'd written a whole book about it. The Polish corridor had to be taken in order for Prussia to return to the fatherland, thereby creating Gross Deutschland, Greater Germany. Once this was achieved, he was planning to pursue Leben's realm to the east, namely Ukraine with its bountiful farmland and the Caucasus for its oil fields, thereby achieving autarky, making the Third Reich self-sufficient. But of course, to make all this possible, they would be required to occupy Poland to ensure territorial integrity and provide a launch pad for their invasion. Conflict with Germany was inevitable. But thankfully, the Western powers had solemnly guaranteed that should Poland be attacked, the Entente Cordiale would ride to their rescue. 
Even so, the Poles had no illusions. As determined and, let's be honest, stupidly defiant as they are, I don't think the Polish language even has a word for surrender, they knew holding out against the full might of the Wehrmacht wasn't possible. They were horribly outnumbered, completely outmatched in the air, and in a hopeless tactical position geographically, facing concentric enemy attacks from no less than four different threat axes. Therefore, the Polish High Command drew a stark conclusion. The only chance they had of winning was to delay the German advance as much as possible regardless of losses. Defensive lines were set up on every river, every city was garrisoned, every forest hid a fortification. They were to hold the line, inflict as many casualties as possible, but most of all, they were to buy time. If they could hold out long enough, the Allies would be able to mobilize and launch a counteroffensive into the Rhineland and the Ruhr, relieving pressure on Poland and perhaps maybe even forcing the Germans to accept terms. The plan assumed, however, that Danzig and Gdynia were primary targets. Their exposed nature at the top of the Polish corridor on the Baltic meant they were practically indefensible. Losing them would leave the Polish navy with no bases to operate from, and so plans were drawn up for this contingency. First was Operation Peking, a joint operation with the Royal Navy. If tensions between Poland and Germany reached the threshold of war, the ocean-going destroyer flotilla representing Poland's only heavy surface group was to relocate to safe harbour in Scotland in order to continue the fight with the Royal Navy. The flagship Witcher, however, was to stay behind to escort the heavy mine layer Griff in the hopes that they would have time to mine the coastline and stand off the Kriegsmarine. The submarines, meanwhile, had a different mission, codenamed Operation Warek. Their job was to guard the coastline against amphibious landings and interdict any German shipping that entered their area of control. Once they'd expended their torpedoes, fuel or supplies, whichever came first, they were to set sail for the UK, or if they were damaged or unable to make it away for any reason, intern themselves in a neutral nation nearby. Every Polish sailor knew their duty. Keep fighting, stay alive, be a problem. They were to keep fighting until Poland was free, even if it took sailing all the way to Canada as Wehrmacht troops landed in Operation Sea Lion and marched to Buckingham Palace. And if how they fought in our version of history is any indication, they would have done exactly that. As September 1st, 1939 dawned, the Polish flagship Witcher was preparing to conduct mine laying operations with Griff, while the submarine flotilla was maintaining a readiness posture. The call to battle stations came suddenly and with very limited information available. Luftwaffe airstrikes were already in progress across practically the entire country, throwing the Polish command and control system into complete confusion. This was the modern incarnation of Bewegungskrieg, maneuver warfare, a doctrine nicknamed, rather erroneously, by the media, as Blitzkrieg. I swear to God, if I hear anyone use the term Blitzkrieg in an academic context again, Geneva's gonna need a bigger suggestion box. With no orders to go on and their operational planning rendered obsolete, the submarine flotilla did really the only thing it could do. Put to sea, pick a sector, and shoot at anything with a swastika ensign. The Orzel left its moorings on the Hell Peninsula opposite Gdynia and sailed into the Baltic, and it wasn't a moment too soon. As they were leaving port, the battleship seschwig holstein which had snuck into Danzig under the guise of a goodwill visit the week before, began opening fire on the Polish fortifications dug in on the Westerplatte Peninsula, signalling the attack for German troops waiting in East Prussia. The first instinct of the submarines was to attack the battleship, given it was so close, and that was indeed the orders going out from Poland's Admiralty. But small escort craft and destroyers from the Prussian enclave had already begun to assemble, while the Luftwaffe began arriving en masse over the city. In the shallow waters of the bay, it would be near suicidal to attempt an attack. Orzel's captain, Captain Henrik Klozikowski, I apologize for the Polish name pronunciation going forward. Sincerely, my Polish friends, I am sorry. Captain Klozikowski made the correct call in that regard. Attacking it would be a bad idea. However, it would be, at least according to his crew and the Polish Navy, the only correct call he'd make. As the submarine took up its patrol station, they came under both sea and air attack. The German minesweepers M3 and M4, having spotted them while surfaced, moved to engage, while German patrol aircraft spotted and fired on them, forcing Orzel to dive. What followed was an aggressive pursuit by the Kriegsmarine vessels, resulting in a depth charge attack that caused shock damage and an oil leak. But with excellent handling and more than a fair share of luck, the first officer, Jan Grudzinski, managed to give the German minesweepers the slip. But, I hear you ask, why was the first officer stepping up and handling this situation? 
Well, here is where it gets a bit murky and controversial. Captain Klozhakowski had been hesitating to take decisive action, and it was his timidity that led them to blundering into an ambush. Now, after taking battle damage, he ordered the Orzel to make way for the island of Gotland in Sweden so they could effect repairs in neutral waters, an act that would most likely result in internment should the Swedish navy discover them, which some of the men suspected was the captain's intention. It was en route to Gotland that Captain Klozhakowski developed a serious illness suspected to be typhus, which some historians suggest was brought on by a nervous breakdown. This was reported to fleet headquarters who, after being apprised of the situation, ordered the Orzel to either run the risk of returning to base past the whole Kriegsmarine Baltic fleet, or break out to a neutral port, repair the ship, and then run for the UK. Needless to say, they chose the latter, but they would end up changing destination. Apparently, Captain Klozhakowski had established some good relations with Estonian naval officers while conducting exercises together pre-war, and the crew hoped to leverage those connections to avoid internment, while getting use out of a port facility. So the Orzel set out for Estonia, reaching the approach to Tallinn Harbour on September 14, 1939. Surfacing their ship and signalling in the clear, Orzel informed the Estonian Navy that their captain was seriously ill and possibly contagious, requiring immediate hospitalization. They also reported significant damage, which included the oil leak and a fault in the submarine's air compressor. Now, according to the Hague Convention, they were entitled to use the port and seek assistance from a neutral nation for a period of 24 hours before having to leave. And the fact that there was a German ship in the harbour meant they also had to wait 24 hours for that German ship to leave. So really, they had about 48 hours to do their business. These are the same rules that doomed the German battleship Graf Spee, for those of you familiar with the Battle of the River Plate. Thus, the Poles requested docking rights in Tallinn to drop off their captain, effect repairs, and then set sail for friendly waters as soon as they were able. However, all was not well in the state of Estonia. For you see, if you recall your history, you would remember that the two mustachioed monsters of Europe had signed an alliance less than a month prior, the contents of which included territorial guarantees for the Soviet Union, those territories being the eastern half of Poland and the Baltic states. As such, Germany had a vested interest in detaining Orsel, not just to protect their own shipping in the Baltic, but to placate their new friends. And with the Soviets on the border just itching for a reason to annex their country, it gave the German ambassador in Tallinn an extra piece of negotiating power, as failure to comply with his requests could result in enforcement action from the east. It also helped that the aforementioned German flagged vessel was currently in port, giving him some international public relations ammunition should he need it. Imagine the headlines, Estonians risk German sailors lives in violation of neutrality. The Estonians were stuck, and they knew it. They legally couldn't turn Orzel away because it would violate the Hague Convention. They also couldn't let them go because their enemies would use it as a pretext for sanctions or, more likely, invasion. So, they were forced to take the only action they could. Compulsory internment. As Orzel pulled into port, the captain was relieved of duty and rushed to hospital. Mooring lines were fastened and repairs begun in earnest. They were completely unaware of the diplomatic mayhem going down in the city between the Polish, German and Estonian representatives. Before the Poles had time to realise something was going wrong, two Estonian patrol ships pulled alongside and ordered them to lay down arms and surrender their vessel for internment. The Poles were dumbfounded. This was a breach of the Hague Convention, but also the time-honoured code of the sea. They were a friendly ship seeking aid in a neutral port. But the Estonian sailors were insistent, immediately boarding the submarine and then seizing all of their maps, charts and navigation equipment. Later, troops from the local garrison arrived and informed the Polish sailors that they were officially being interned at the harbour to assist in the demilitarization of their ship. But as we've established at the very start of this video, despite the fact that they live in the snowy cold of Eastern Europe, when it comes to wars, the Poles have absolutely no chill. They were going to join the Royal Navy and continue the fight against fascism regardless of what anyone has to say. And if that meant taking somewhat, uh, drastic actions, then so be it. In fact, the Royal Navy attaché to Estonia visited the crew of the Orzel in port and handed them his business card, and on the back was simply written, Good luck. 
Over the next two days, the crew of the Orzel steadily began demilitarizing their submarine. First, they dismantled the main gun on the foredeck, surrendering the ammunition to the Estonian guards. Next, they went to do the same to their AA gun, but oh no! The crane broke! That's uh, inconvenient. Well, um, look, we're going to have to do this job by hand. It's going to take us ages. That's going to take us at least another day, maybe even two. So with that out of the question, they were going to have to remove the torpedoes instead. And so they started pulling one torpedo out, then two. They cleared out the forward torpedo tubes and then gosh darn it, wouldn't you know it, the torpedo hoist on board was damaged in the depth charge attack and that broke too. And with the crane broken, it's going to take us at least a week to get all this stuff out. Hell, it's a miracle we even managed to moor our ship correctly with only two lines available. And they're looking a bit flimsy too. Are you sure these were secured? Pro I think you guys can see where this is going. First officer Jan Gradinsky, now captain, had been sabotaging the various implements required for their demilitarization, and even now was stashing various pieces of equipment while planning their escape. While during their off hours, the crew went fishing in a dinghy to check the depth of the harbour and uh, check the layout for an escape route. They were going to do the one thing a respectable sailor should never do, but the situation calls for it. And if I may invoke the spirit of the fictional space pioneer Mark Watney from The Martian, they were imprisoned in Tallinn, and since their ship was interned, it was technically under the jurisdiction of the Estonian government, so they were planning on breaking out of a federal detention centre in order to steal a ship from a neutral nation, which would then be used to attack other vessels in international waters, which, by definition, makes them pirates. These Polish pirates were about to do what they call in the business, some gangster shit. As midnight approached on September 17th, a small team of sailors armed with various tools from the engine room moved through the murky darkness in between the buildings of the port. Their target, the generator and transformer station for the entire facility. Blackouts were common in recent times with all the chaos going on, plus electrification in Eastern Europe was still a bit hit or miss at this stage. And with a brand new moon in the sky, the ambient light was basically zero. Meanwhile, the rest of the Poles were in the process of getting ready to leave. There were two armed guards manning their ship. They would have to grab these guys and disarm them before they could raise the alarm. To do that, they'd have to approach stealthily, meaning the signal for the operation start would be their comrades cutting the lights. Captain Grzynski didn't have to wait long. As the clock passed midnight, there was an indistinct clunk in the distance, like someone slamming a door or, perhaps, crowbarring one open. Suddenly, the lights across the port immediately went dark. Great, thought the Estonian guards, another damn blackout. Or so they thought. With the speed and stealth of a clan of ninjas, the Polish crew dashed through the night to the quayside, taking the guards completely by surprise. Quickly disarming them, the crew of the proud ship Orzel got busy preparing their submarine for departure, taking the two bewildered guards below deck as hostages. Soon the dark shapes of their comrades emerged from the shadows to rejoin the ship's company. They had taken a detour, cutting the telephone cables and sabotaging searchlights. It was then, things started to go horribly wrong. Shouts were heard. Flashlights began cutting through the night. A few of the spotlights they failed to sabotage switched on. Army boots started clattering on concrete. The game was up. It was time to leave. The Estonian garrison, having caught on to what was happening, heard the engine start and immediately moved to stop the Poles from boarding. But realizing their guards were gone and they were already starting the engines, they opened fire. Rifle rounds started whizzing past, followed by the chatter of a machine gun smacking into the conning tower. The two men, armed with their stolen rifles, joined the fray and a firefight broke out. The mooring lines were cut, the engines roared to full speed, and the eagle slowly started to pull away. Using this opportunity to break contact, the two men keeping the Estonians busy slid down the conning tower's ladder, fastening the hatch behind them. It was time to go. But it wasn't going to be easy. Sailing in a hurry with no harbour charts or maps, navigating out of Tallinn was going to be difficult, and they couldn't very well stay on the surface. Even as they started their escape, the port's defensive shore batteries had begun turning their guns towards them. They'd have to submerge. But harbours, as one could imagine, aren't very deep, especially in the Baltic. 
There are rocks and shoals all along the Baltic coastline, while Tallinn itself has a very shallow entrance to the harbour. But Captain Grudzinski knew it was a risk he and his men would have to take. Running as fast as they safely could with their decks awash, they braved the spray of small arms fire and an occasional 100mm shell from the nearby shore battery, which was steadily getting more accurate. Then, disaster. Upon reaching the mouth of the harbour, the ship shuddered to a halt as it beached on a sandbar. Seizing the opportunity, the Estonian gunners lined up a shot and fired. They were short by maybe 20 yards or so, but the shock of the explosion knocked out the communication system and bent the propeller shaft. It looked like it was all over, but the captain was thinking fast. With open water in front of them, he ordered an emergency blow of the ballast tanks and all ahead full. The submarine lurched up and catapulted off the sandbar. It practically rocketed into the Gulf of Finland. As the gunfire disappeared into the distance, sirens blared and panicked phone calls were made to the various embassies. But it didn't matter. The Poles had made it. The great ship Eagle was once again in the hands of her countrymen still armed with torpedoes and ready to fight. They'd made it. But now, they were faced with several problems. First was the fact that the Estonians had seized all their navigation equipment. And second, but perhaps more importantly, what to do with their prisoners. The two wide-eyed Estonian soldiers sitting under guard were completely unharmed, just incredulous at the evening's turn of events. They would be breaking just about every law and treaty in the book, if they attacked the Germans with them on board. But they couldn't go back to Estonia since they were, understandably, really pissed. So they did the only logical thing they could do. They sailed to Gotland in Sweden, surfaced the ship, and deposited both men in a rubber raft offshore with a fresh set of clothes and all the cash they had on board. When the Estonians asked why they were being so generous, the Poles replied, Men returning from the underworld deserve to travel first class, considering the Germans and Soviets had declared them dead. After dropping off their two prisoners, they now returned to their main issue. However, their navigator had come to the rescue. He kept a lot of reference material on board to help him in his navigation, including a book which had a map marking Europe's lighthouses. Using this book, they could follow the coastline and draw their own map matching the lighthouse positions to their relative position. Combine that with some basic astral navigation and a book on star navigation that he also had, they could plot a relatively accurate position fix down to about 100 meters. It was insane. They basically hand drew their own navigation charts. That said, it wasn't the optimal solution and the Poles planned on boarding a German merchant ship to steal their maps at the first opportunity. So yes, I wasn't even memeing. They were literally planning to become pirates. Because these guys are badasses. Sadly, German civil shipping in the area was on hold. It would have been awesome if they'd done it, but, you know, all they ran into was warships. But yet again, there was another problem. Coastlines, by definition, are shallow. And what's more, they are usually patrolled. As I just said, they kept running into warships, especially in wartime as it was now. Worse still, despite being armed, they had taken worse damage than they thought. They had a bent prop shaft, shock damage to the hull, a damaged rudder, no comms, and they were looking dangerously low on fuel. Captain Grzynski made the hard decision to abandon combat and head to Britain as per the plan. But because their exit from Tallinn had been so spectacular, both the German and the Soviet Baltic fleets were out looking for them. Evading them through shallow water with nothing but the stars and the occasional lighthouse was going to be nearly impossible. But these absolute mad lads pulled it off. They managed to sneak out of the Baltic and through the Skagerrak without getting spotted. They had a close shave, they had several in fact, when the surface group that attacked Danzig passed right by them on the way back to Kiel, while a German patrol plane flew right over them, and a patrol boat mistook them for a Swedish submarine. But other than that, they got out completely without incident. Until they met the Royal Navy, that is. Because the moment they got out into the open waters of the North Sea, the British saw a submarine sailing west from the German coastline and went, Oh look, a target! It's a U-boat! Let's kill it! Thankfully, though, the Poles had become rather adept at evasion by now and managed to sleuth their way past the blockade unscathed. 
until eventually, after some much needed improvisational repairs, they got their communications working. The Polish submarine Orzel, having survived just about everything the world could throw at it, surfaced off the coast of Scotland near the Firth of Forth, aggressively signalling, I am a Pole, please don't shoot me, where she was soon picked up by the British destroyer HMS Valorous. And thus, what Winston Churchill called the greatest adventure story of the war came to an end, eight days after the capitulation of their homeland. But Orzel would fight on. It was not the end for them. After going through a refit and overhaul, she set sail on a war patrol in support of Allied naval operations in Scandinavia, where she sunk the first German vessel lost during their invasion of Norway. She continued to serve with distinction until, sadly, later in June 1940, she was lost with all hands for reasons unknown, though she is presumed to have either hit a mine or been destroyed by German coastal patrol aircraft. Nevertheless, the Polish submarine Eagle has left an incredible legacy, and her daring escape from Tallinn sent shockwaves around the world. The Soviets, being, well, the Soviets, immediately lodged a protest with the Estonian government, stating that their failure to stop Orzel's escape was proof that their naval security measures were insufficient to enforce their neutrality. Thus, it was the responsibility of the Soviet Union to enforce it for them. Then, conveniently, a Soviet cargo vessel named the Metalist was sunk nearby in the Gulf of Finland by a torpedo attack. Now this was obviously the work of those dastardly Poles. Estonia is not only violating the laws of neutrality, but demonstrating gross incompetence that has cost Soviet lives. As such, we have no alternative but to establish military bases on your territory to ensure your neutrality. However, we want to stress, it's not an invasion or a war. We are simply protecting you from aggressive neighbours. After all, these are unique, one might even say special circumstances, requiring a military response. A special military operation, if you will. Later it was discovered, after the Finnish captured Soviet naval prisoners during the Winter War, that the sinking of the cargo ship Metalist was carried out by the Soviet torpedo boat Tuka on the orders of the Leningrad Communist Party secretary, in order to create a pretext for Estonia's occupation by the Red Army. Shocker. I could not have seen that coming. However, one outcome of the Soviet occupation of the Baltics that nobody saw coming was that Captain Klozhakowski was taken prisoner by the Red Army and deported to the UK to face court-martial by the Polish government in exile. He was found guilty of cowardice and desertion, but sentence was suspended due to the war. He was demoted completely to enlisted rank 1, the rank of seaman, later to be dismissed in disgrace. He was, ironically, the ORP Orzel's only survivor. But not quite. Because while this story is relatively obscure, in the Polish Navy, her name lives on in legend. Much like the USS Enterprise for the United States Navy, she holds a special place in the heart of Poland sailors. So much so that in the entire history of the Polish submarine service and in the history of the Polish Navy, there has always been an eagle in the fleet. And in the post-Cold War world, where navies across the globe were reduced in size, the Polish Navy today only has one submarine. And that submarine bears the name, the ORP Orzel. Równosilnik gra, jak śmiało śmigło tnie Już ginie pośród chmur najśmielszych marzeń Niegotyczny ślad, niestraszny mrok i mgła Niestraszny wiatr co dnie Jesteśmy od nich, a ramenci od tysiące lat 
Hajt i z nas, ktoś padnie wśród szaleńczych jazd, czerwieńszy będzie kwadrat nasz lotniczy znak. Znów pełny gaz, bo cóż, że spada któraś z gwiazd, gdy cała wnet te skadra pomknie na szlak. Za wrót do koczą śmiały silnik, a wycie i wyrównanie, aż się z biały kwiat jasny krąg ziemi oszalały i nie pękicie, i w szczęści świata za ciasne. Leć w górę znaku nasz, nie trzeba wcale słów, Skrzydla tych ludzi do słaby drzwi odmyka orła, mamy hart, gdy Polski czuj na straż, Usary dawnej kur, nie ścichnie nigdy dali głos silnika, hej na start! A jeśli z nas ktoś padnie wśród szaleńczych jazd, Trwieńszy będzie kwadrat nasz lotniczy znak. Znów pełny gaz, bo cóż, że spada któraś z gwiazd, Gdy cała wnet te skadra pomknie na szlak. Lotnik strzyla, ty władca świat, 